Hello, thank you, Julie, and thank you to the people who are with us today or listening down the track. Welcome. Um, and thank you for taking the time to join us on the webinar, wherever you are. Um, and um, I know if you have been fire affected recently, how difficult it is to make some time to take a break and um, and uh, even to get off your property. So uh, this webinar should make it easier for you to access that information. Uh, I'm Nikki Stewart. I uh, own and operate Kersbrook Equestrian Centre in the Adelaide Hills. We've been here since the early 90s um, and in 2015 um, on uh, the 1st of January we were affected by the Samson Flat Fire quite extensively and um, Julie asked me to talk to the Cudley Creek Fire Horse Owners Network um, about some strategies for recovery and resilience. Um, we're five years out, so um, I've got a little bit to share, hopefully that will be useful to, um, you find something useful in there for each and every one of you. Um, but the way I'm going to structure things is just do uh, tell a little story about um, our experience with fire and uh, get you to where we are today. So this is an aerial view of um, Kersbrook Equestrian Centre. We're northeast of Adelaide, uh, quite near the Barossa. We're in the old fashioned terms about 85 acres of a, a long uh, valley. Um, this is uh, from when just before we bought the property we got the aerial photo and this was the layout of the fences pre-fire. Um, so uh, you can see we've got uh, uh, extensive forest to our west um, and we're bordered by rural properties to the east and a road to the south um, and to the north is a little bit more property bushland and uh, forest as well so that's the Mount Crawford forest to our left. Um, so I just wanted to pause a little bit and say I, I did put quite a lot of thought into this presentation normally I'm talking about horse training or behaviour um, but um, I'm not an expert in, in this field, obviously. I've learned as I've gone along and I'm not a psychologist. I'm just a horse trainer and a property owner. And I've got a pretty good idea what you're going through now. Um, so, and having seen a fire on your property, if that's what's happened, then you're now an expert in what happens um, on your property and you'll be making plans to, uh, for the future as to how you recover from that. Um, so that's the layout. We'll come back to this photo uh, later when I talk about how we change things. I'll just give you a little bit of an idea. This is the um, the dwellings and the main shedding. There's it's a little bit faded out, but there's a, a big indoor arena there and stables. And this is a show jumping arena here. Um, so. Um, I'm going to now tell you a little bit about the story about how the fire happened on our property so you've got a, a bit of an idea about things. But before I do that, I just wanted to show you this motley crew um, who would have given them the job of running an equestrian centre. That's my dad there. Um, he was fond of wearing his genuine Viking helmet and was a bit of a character. This is my sister and this is myself. Um, and this is um, a dear friend who um, has been with us from the start, Jason Robinson, and I've put his photo there because he was the only member of this crew that um, went through the fire with me um, and has been instrumental in helping me uh, and the property recover and rebuild. Uh, so that, that was us who kicked off things in uh, 1992. We bought the property in a very rundown state. Um, we were always conscious of fire risk, but nowhere near as prepared as what we are today. Um, and Dad's no longer with us, and you'll notice I'm, um, my mum's not there. She, she died when I was uh, 18. Um, so we started out as a crew together um, with a rural property and a horse property which was something new to us and we've learned along the way. Uh, so on the day of um, Samson Flat um, it was a very similar day um, weather wise and rating wise as the Cudley Creek fire and having a look at it it, uh, it 
sort of behaved quite similarly to the experience that we've had with the Cudley Creek fire that burnt through a large section of the Adelaide Hills. Uh, so Samson Flat started um, about uh, seven kilometres uh, to the south and west of us. I was at home monitoring, uh, obviously, alerts. Um, I saw that and thought, yep, the wind blowing in our direction. Uh, I need to start putting about our putting into place our fire plan and um, Jason was away working in the city. Uh, I rang him and let him know and then um, very shortly after that we were told that the fire had been contained so I relaxed a little bit um, but was still watchful. Uh, within an hour or so it wasn't contained, it had gotten away from the fireys so we were well and truly in action mode uh, and uh, as far as the travel of the fire, we, we were hit quite early in the, uh, in the scheme of things on that Friday afternoon. Um, so this is what, uh, what the property entrance looked like before the fire. And this is what it looked like after the fire. And there'll be scenes that are very familiar to all of you have, who have had, um, if you haven't lost your house, um, typically what's happened in these fire events is uh, the fire's taken all of your property in your pasture and your fences um, and you've got a rather large mess left behind and possibly nowhere to keep your stock or you've lost stock so I do understand uh, the impact that you'll be going through at the moment. Uh, so a little bit about the fire on the day and what we did. Um, it, we, uh, our plan was to uh, dependent on how many people were on the place so I was on the place on my own so all the horses were released uh, by opening the gates they already had their head collars and their rugs off and any fly masks and they were given uh, the run of the property of the 85 acres with the, the front gate closed I didn't I see what they did during the fire event but I'll tell you a little bit of about that in a moment. So that's a, another before photo and this is what it looked like um, after Samson flat fire and this is me um, the day after when I'm um, out having a little look around and seeing the extent of the damage um, and I, I do know now looking back particularly at that photo I can see the trauma in my face. Um, I'm a, my coping strategy is I'm a doer not a talker. Um, everybody will be different but uh, as I was walking around that day um, I was already seeing little glimmers of hope in that uh, the fencing that you can see behind me was all wire. That's what we put up when we moved on to the place um, but I'd already you know I don't like wire and horses but it was the best we could do at the time and I was already thinking probably on that day huh, I've got a clean slate to work with. Um, what can I do to come out of this event um, in a better position than, than I entered it as far as managing my property. Uh, so uh, getting back to what happened on the day, the, uh, the horses obviously had free run of the property. Jason got home in record speed, um, broke some land speed records possibly, and we got busy defending the property. Um, we had some rooftop sprinklers and uh, fire hoses around the house. Our priority was to make that defendable. Uh, but in the uh, stress of the event, uh, we were operating our fire pump with the choke open uh, and we hadn't closed it properly and uh, the pressure started to wane and we didn't feel that we and neither of us could solve the problem that's probably an indication of the stress that we we're under even though we'd done practice and routine that pump offered uh, operated a little bit differently than other ones that we used more regularly and um, was a good learning experience in in hindsight um, but uh, as the fire got closer to us um, we decided that we had a safe exit route and we left and uh, sheltered with our dogs and our exit kit at the Kersbrook Oval which is about a k and a half away. Lots of people there with their horses and animals uh, had taken refuge as well. Uh, while we were off the property, um, these guys um, who were part of the 
uh, SA Forestry Fire Defence crew because uh, they were they were around uh, protecting the forestry asset had realised that they'd lost that asset and came up our drive and saw that we were defendable. So we have them to thank for um, defending our property and saving our house. The horses, we're not quite sure what they were doing. There was only one patch of unburnt grass on the entire property. Um, and uh, one of our dear friends, Bill Harbison, who was our vet for many years, had also come onto the property himself and uh, gotten busy with his fire unit. He tells us that um, it was pretty dramatic. The forest next to us was throwing fire bombs and uh, animals were escaping that fire in front of the front. So uh, I imagine it was fairly dramatic. So we sheltered um, at the Kersbrook Oval for a couple of hours and then came back onto the property. Uh, had we not, we would have lost the house that night. Uh, but that's another story. Um, four of our horses were impacted by the fire. We had 12 on the property at the time um, and they were probably the less mobile horses. They did tend to stick together with the horses that they knew. Um, this boy here, Whiskey, he was the oldest of them and he would have been approaching 30 on the day of the fire but had lived all his life on the property um, and this was my thoroughbred eventer who got burnt and this is a little stock horse that was with us at the time and um, on the scale of burns they they got off pretty lightly um, and interestingly they were all burned identically uh, from the tip of their nose along the just only the right side of their body and onto their hindquarters here was probably where they bore most of it so I, I'm guessing that they turned their bums into a fire front or maybe they got caught and they all came out of that with the fire on their on their um, right hand side I'm not sure um, they were all excellent patients we had excellent support from uh, vets and uh, the other authorities that help you with your managing your, your burn stock and I'm happy to say they all recovered um, they were very sore um, but uh, we managed them on the property and um, they, they've um, they've all survived whiskey uh, uh, on the day of the your of the Cudley Creek fire, came down with colic at age thirty five and didn't survive that weekend. So, um, but that was him not so long ago. Um, and this is Lancey one year later competing, and he went on to be a, um, um, a very active um, ride for Rihanna. So they survived, um, and that was one of the happy. Uh, outcomes of the fire. We, when we were initially rounding them up post the fire, we thought we couldn't locate six, um, and that was that was immensely stressful. Um, but right on dusk, they came trotting up the driveway um, home for dinner. I'm not sure where they'd been, but they hadn't left the property, um, even though all our fences were down and so forth. We didn't have any wire injuries. They all managed to find. Uh, somewhere where they could um, shelter or uh, as the others do they they maybe were out running the fire I'm not sure what happened um, so uh, you know, every fire has its own pattern as does the colic that whiskey suffered it occurred to me when I was thinking about it they'll, they'll all run their own course but the we have general principles that help us manage those situations and as horse people I'm sure you'll be able to relate to that um, so that's the summary of the event. Oh, this was, I wanted to put this in because this happened within a week of our fire. Um, we had a decent amount of rain, which was such a relief. Um, I'm looking very glamorous because I was running out of clothes that were appropriate to wear um, and uh, a very dodgy umbrella. Um, but that was a very happy moment. And it meant we actually got green pick um, uh, we managed our horses on the property. Uh, we put up temporary fencing um, with electric tape uh, and uh, gave them lots of lots of hay. Uh, initially, they were in the stables, but when we could, when we had um, those temporary fences organised, um, they it managed it served us quite well until we got a boundary fence up um, with lots of help from other people and um, the authorities that are on hand to help. Um, with rebuilding your your property, um, so that was a nice happy event. 
Uh, I'm going to move on now to two weeks past post the fire. For Cudley Creek people, I think we're heading to three weeks, but this is relevant for anybody who's um, been through a fire event. And I wanted to list the challenges and then on the opposite side, the blessings. The challenges are obviously a longer list, um, but you can see that there's some that cross over that are the same on both sides. So you can look at it as a challenge or a blessing. Um, uh, definitely, uh, I thought that I was coping very well uh, with the trauma of this event, but looking back, I know probably my fuse was a bit shorter. I was definitely traumatised by the sound of any water bombers going over because this fire went on for some days. Um, uh, so that was a trigger. Um, uh, things that we were having to cope with was lack of sleep, obviously. Uh, Jason and I, who were the main people on the property, my husband works overseas, so I didn't have him around until later in the piece. But initially, um, lack of sleep, we, we slept in, in shifts. Um, I, I haven't put it there, but um, having your boundaries uh, was a challenge. Lots of, lots of, it's probably under visitors and helpers lots of people wanting to help, um, feeling that they had free and open access to your property. Um, and while we were very appreciative of that, um, it was an extra demand and an extra stress that we had to work through managing. And I did put a sign on my gate. Uh, the, the gate was still standing, but the fence wasn't either side, but they couldn't drive around the gate if it was closed. So it just had a little sign on it saying, we welcome your help, but please let us know you're coming um, and uh, we, we'll, we'll, we'll be happy to see you. Um, so just having that little boundary really uh, helped us manage in those weeks after the fire. Dealing with judgment, those who love us and, and uh, were concerned about us were, were unhappy, some of them, that we had stayed and that the plan that we had done uh, that didn't uh, suit their expectations we we learned how to cope with that and we just said thank you very much for your concern and but that's what we chose to do and, it, and it's happened obviously the challenge of communications uh just communicating with all those people around the country who want to know how, how you're doing and uh want to offer help we're still you, you're still navigating how you're going to um organize that help keeping yourself fed um, that's important uh, everybody's got different coping strategies um, in those moments um, I, I just get busy some people I know you know value meditation and so forth so dealing with those challenges is a very individual thing um, working through negotiating and communicating and seeing what authorities could offer. We had one very stressful moment in, in those weeks post the fire where we went to um, uh, get the grant that was available for fire affected um, property owners and we were refused on the basis that we hadn't, had, hadn't evacuated for a long enough period of time, I think was the criteria and that we hadn't lost food in our fridge. So that was when we went into that situation expecting help and uh, didn't get it. That was uh, very difficult. Uh, I have to say they did revise their decision, so that was good. The information flow, um, starting to deal with neighbours, some of who weren't insured um, for fencing, where we had common fencing and had lost houses. Um, they were very stressed and worried about their situation, so starting to uh, get to know some of the neighbours. We've got seven, including the forestry. Um, keeping up with the washing with all your sooty clothing and then a very important one is um, learning how to accept help i think us horse people are pretty independent souls and uh we're not really used to accepting help but that was a lesson and a challenge that um we had to work through um we we got some uh the blessing of rain if we look at the blessing side the volunteers some of the most valuable volunteers which i'm sure people at this far out from a fire event will recognise is that those that just turn up prepared with tools and ready to help and just get on with it and will take a little bit of direction. We had some church groups, I remember them coming in and they were just fantastic. They were organised. Blaze Aid, of course, where would we be without Blaze Aid? Um, the authorities were there to help us uh, coming in and destroying wildlife that were affected was very, um, was a blessing to be able to help us with that. 
um, our friends who rallied around and our neighbours. And then going back to what I was saying in those early days, we had a clean slate to work with um, as far as our fencing goes. Uh, so they're the two weeks post fire, the things that I recall being challenges and blessings. Our priorities, as I'm sure you'll relate to, um, post fire was if you've got stock on the property, how you manage and control that stock. Um, your personal safety is, of course, uh, paramount because you've still got active fire hotspots and trees and things falling down. And uh, one of the things that we we resolved to do is to work in pairs after I wasn't working in a pair and was getting a bit gung ho about uh, repairing something uh, and sliced my finger open on a piece of metal. So it could have been worse. It took me out of action as far as being able to use my hands for a while with stitches. So your personal safety, of course, is important. Um, your water and plumbing, wow, what a challenge that is. You know, you've dealt with a fire and you need water and if your poly pipe's been above ground or has been gotten hot or your pump's been impacted upon just getting water up and running again, I know that's that's a real priority. Of course, your fodder, if you've lost fodder or you haven't got, you haven't got ground cover now, managing you know, where you get that from and can you afford it and um, you know, saying yes to donations. Um, so being able to say yes and no <laughs> um, is important post fire. Uh, cleaning up, obviously everybody wants to get busy cleaning up. Um, uh, pace yourself um, would be my advice. Uh, it, it'll get done. Uh, it, we all want to clean up as soon as we can, but just make some priorities as to what's the important thing to clean up. Seek that financial assistance, it's there. I think the government is better organised and the bodies that are there to help you with financial assistance are making it easier as we get more experience, unfortunately, with dealing with fire events. And then negotiating your insurance claims and, and discovering whether you're adequately covered or not and, and getting your quotes is one of your priorities in the weeks post the fire. Some of the advice is uh, from some of my friends who went through it and it's good advice is to make sure you, you start um, talking to fencing contractors who you are aware of do a good job and get those quotes, get in and, and get yourself on the list um, with your fencing contractors should you need contractors to help you rebuild your property. Uh, I just wanted to put this little photo in because this was the, the day of rain and, and um, celebrating the uh, that and being able to put the horses back out and let them move around um, was uh, a happy day. Uh, and watching the horse behaviour post the fires, you know, there were horses that had lived on the property all their lives and uh, their behaviour did change. They were definitely traumatised. They, I think they had to recalibrate. You can see in the distance here, this is the larger paddock to the north of us. Uh, my thoroughbred that was burnt spent a lot of time gazing up that paddock. He removed himself from the group. He wasn't the most sociable of horses before the fire, but he spent a lot of time on his own, just staring off into the distance. Um, I think he had to get his his view of the world recalibrated and some people have told me that their horses do still stay did stay a little bit sensitive um, post the fire but on the whole they they all settled back once once we had routine for them uh, they all managed quite well uh, this is the one of those challenges that might be a familiar sight for some of you uh, that that that's our main pump um, from the dam to to get header up to the header headed dam and uh, you can see that was non-operational and all the pipe work around it was gone so um, that I do appreciate is one of those challenges as far as managing your horses post the fire speak to your vet uh, they, they're best placed to tell you if you've got still stock on on burnt ground uh, how to manage them and their health and um, the other effects of smoke inhalation and so forth. We didn't have any of those difficulties. Our horses, um, apart from the burn ones, came out very well on the other side. So now I want to talk a little bit about resilience and uh, we can look at the definition of that, the act of rebounding or springing back. Some of you may not feel that you're at that point yet um, and that's perfectly okay, um, but you're probably taking those first steps along the path 
to um, bouncing back, which um, there'll be plenty of people to help you along the way. Um, we're, as horse people, I think we're pretty optimistic bunch. We work with five or 600 kilo horses and um, we're, we're pretty optimistic that we can control them. Obviously we've got strategies to do that, which we've learned and we're also hard workers. I don't know any horse person who's not afraid, who's afraid of hard work. Um, so that's in our favour as resilience goes. Um, the things that I think are important to draw upon, and this is just my experience, um, everybody's different, but being part of a community here definitely uh, assisted us. People knew us and, and uh, we'd, we'd been an active part of the community and Kersbrook's a small town and everybody got on with uh, look, helping each other out. I think uh, what helped me personally was my life experience. Um, it's, this is, this is you know, grief that we're dealing with, grief of, of the loss of our property and the impact on our horses and the extent um, of the impact is personal for everybody. But to me, it feels a lot like grief and having had lost my mother at an early age and uh, uh, my father died before the fire, um, I think I drew on that life experience. Also, um, I grew up as, as the daughter of a, a dad was an army officer. So we moved around a lot. Um, so my life experience had me as a fairly shy youngster having to um, cope with that act of leaving a home fairly routinely. I think I had 30 homes by the time I was 30 and we finally settled here in Kersbrook. Um, so uh, that built some resilience in me, I think, and having to adapt to change. So when I reflect on what helped me and um, for most of my adult life, I had drawn on um, professionals in the field of counselling to help me with difficult situations or conversations. Um, so I had some skills already in my, my skill set on how to deal with trauma and difficulties. So that helped me and you'll all have life experience that you can draw upon. Uh, your relationships will be tested, your personal close relationships, um, be kind to one another. Uh, take a moment before you have that, those discussions that are about immediate priorities or future and um, draw on those relationships and friendships. The institutional support that's available, that certainly helped us um, become resilient and then the self-care that's important um, for for you just to uh, you'll know what helps you um, and make sure that you do give that a priority in your uh, in your rebounding from this event some of the strat suggested strategies that I learned along the way for aiding resilience is to take your time to research and to plan if you if you're needing to think about what's going to happen for the future, um, prepare, take the time to prepare um, and cooperate and work with others, um, particularly your neighbours, because they're going to stay your neighbours for a while. Um, find a way to work in with them uh, if, if that is a bit of a strain. Uh, pace yourself. Um, your time is your friend. You can, you can use it and pace yourself. As I've said, accepting some help. Celebrating your achievements, the milestones, the events that happen along the way, I think is really important. Uh, if you get the opportunity to pay it forward and help somebody else out, um, I think that makes us feel, feel good. Um, and to have a laugh, and I've got a couple of photos here. This is uh, from a Facebook post of, um, uh, someone who was affected by the Cudley Creek fire recently and it's a I think it's a few days post the fire she was extensively burnt um, and you can see her comment there she's celebrating just some green grass that's come through and she shared that so I think that celebration of the positives is really important for for your resilience um, and uh, this, this is uh, just some examples of the community that helped us out. We had a donation of permapine vineyard posts um, uh, from uh, vineyards around the place and I didn't have a tractor and I um, wasn't sure how I was going to unload these posts and here come my local heroes with their tractors and they got the job done and uh, this is uh, Andrew Levitt who's a local and uh, 
Mr. James, Neville James and Faz, who were um, just brilliant and got that job done. So um, that was, uh, they had, uh, these gentlemen probably had a closer relationship with my father, but um, that community spirit was strong in the, in the weeks and months after the fire. Uh, our property is very hilly, uh, so in the rebuild um, phase, uh, getting posts on the boundary was a challenge. I don't know how they did it in the first place, um, but a lot of us, a lot of the posts we had to dig or finish by hand. Um, we made it a bit of fun. The dogs got involved. Um, this is Jason took this photo of me. I'm very attractive, <laughs> um, and uh, this one I've got a special title for. That's um, fence builders crack. Um, so we had a little bit of a laugh as as we went along um, in the act of rebuilding. So now I want to take you to 12 months post the fire um, and uh, what we what we uh, got about doing and where we got to in the. 12 months. Uh, what I, I would suggest that when you're having a look at your property and um, you're thinking about how you want to rebuild is to ask yourself a question which um, I thought was useful is do you want it back the way it was? Maybe it was fab fabulous the way it was and you'd, had, you'd only done it recently and you had the opportunity to to know how your land worked and what suited you best as far as management goes. But um, before Samson Flatfire, I was already on the path of having an understanding of how we could manage horses differently and our properties differently. And uh, this woman, Jane Myers, uh, was I'd been in contact with through other channels and was aware of her work. And she had in, visited the property before and then in the weeks after the fire she uh, she saw the the extent of the damage so uh, for me personally I had a look at my property and I decided I wanted to do something differently um, and uh, I had a look at the equicentral uh, uh, strategies of managing the property and I integrated even though we're a commercial adjustment property primarily now I wanted to integrate those uh, ways of, of building and managing your, your property and your horses that um, gave them excellent outcomes as far as welfare and well-being and uh, as horses and uh, and catered for them as naturally as possible on the land that I had available and also cared for the land. We, we'd inherited a very degraded property when we bought it and it had taken 20 or 30 years to get it to where it was pre samson flat and I didn't want to lose all that work and I knew that Jane's work um, and on the equicentral system was the way I wanted to go. Um, if you're interested, that's the website. You can sign up to receive a free mini course all about horse grazing behaviour and how you can set up your property. So I wanted to mention that because that was a big influence on how we rebuilt. I'm going to take you back to this aerial photo so you can see how the property was laid out before the fire. We had 12 paddocks, one large paddock that had cross country fences in it. So we left that and our school horses, when we were running the riding school, they all lived out together there. But we didn't have just as all the time but just as in those days and still it, it's there today um, wanted their horses in single holding so we catered for that and these paddocks here they could carry more than one horse but um, they averaged a couple of acres each you can see um, we've, we've um, the sizes roughly you probably can't see that but if you zoom in later you can but that's roughly how the property was laid out with um, plain wire and cider wire and stock fencing on these boundaries. We did things differently, um, rebuilding post fire. And if we turn it around, that's the north of the property. This is how it looks today. Uh, we've got a watercourse that runs through there. It would have been nice to be maybe able to exclude the horses from the watercourse. It's a winter watercourse. We've got big catchment with this dam, but um, uh, the best I could manage was this is a more permanent winter creek. Um, I set a uh, front fence, that's the road boundary there. That's not a fence, um, but this is a fence. Um, and this is our gateway now where previously that was where our fencing ran up to. But now uh, the front uh, fence is set behind the watercourse. So that's been given back to nature 
and we just make sure that that's uh, doing what it needs to do as far as getting water into the larger catchment and this section here of the property is very steep um, and that was a paddock previously but it's now just return to nature. Um, so uh, we re-fenced into six paddocks, um, much larger paddocks. I wanted double fencing. Um, I didn't want horses interacting over fences anymore. Not that we had a lot of injuries, but it always used to give me the willies when they ran along fence lines. So these are raceways that give us access to the forest and this is a shelter belt. Um, the forestry boundary where we don't have any stock, I'll show you how we refence that very simply and economically. Uh, our neighbours, this neighbour here doesn't run any stock, that's a bush property that used, I used to own this house by the way and that, that went and this is where he's had to rebuild because uh, that you wouldn't have been able to defend. Um, and But this neighbour here, he's got stock. These two neighbours in the middle don't have stock and this neighbour does have stock and by stock I mean cattle or sheep. Um, not horses um, and uh, so six six large paddocks we left this one the same dimension but we changed this and um, it, it occurred to me thinking about this uh, when we had a fire event near us just on the weekend and we put our uh, fire plan back into action it's much different or it's evolved since 2015 um, but I, it occurred to me that with these larger paddocks had I been unable to um, put the horses onto the safe haven now, which is the show jumping arena, um, we, we've made openings here in the fence lines so the horses can circumnavigate the, the whole property around to here. Uh, I could have opened those um, if I had time. If not, these paddocks being larger give your horses a lot more options if a fire does hit that paddock. So I thought that's one of the benefits that um, going from those small paddocks to these large ones. If you didn't have time and you had to evacuate and leave your horses, that gives them a little bit more of a chance to uh, get away from a fire. So that's, that's the layout of the property today. Uh, and it, I love it. Um, it works beautifully. Uh, this is the materials that we decided to work with. Uh, these are wood shield posts, they're untreated pine encased in um, recycled plastic, so they're nice and environmentally friendly. They're rated organic, very easy to work with um, and quite economical. They can be rammed into the ground, you don't have to um, tamp them down, they can be knocked in. Um, and they've worn really quite well over five years. I'm not here to endorse any particular product, but this is what worked well for us. Uh, this is, uh, they're both Australian products too, by the way, manufactured in Australia. This is um, the Stock Guard Broad Tape, which comes in green or brown. Um, and uh, we've set these runs high because we've got a, we get a lot of native animals through the property and we were forever fixing fences that they'd impacted upon um, and setting them high get, lets them just go along. We've got very little maintenance to do anymore because they just duck under that fence. Uh, we've had a couple of horses run in or through those fences and they have been utterly unscathed. Uh, this is the tape gates that go through the raceway. So I just wanted to show you what we've chosen to work with. We went with the two high uh, and you know you could start with one. It's maybe set a little bit lower. And if you've only got horses, that's a really economical way. Uh, these, you know, they're, they're already insulated, these posts, but they're your insulators. So, um, and I do know for what it's worth that the, the wood shield and stock guard people are, are happy to talk to you about how they can save you some money if you do choose to go with those, those products. They've been very good at support post fire and installation for us. Um, and one of the suggestions was if there's, landholders that are close together you can save some money with freight or unloading uh, should you go down that path. Uh, so that's what we've refenced with. We did put yards within all of the, you couldn't see it on the aerial photo but all of the paddocks, uh, well most of them and we will add more as we go along, it, um, have got yards within these large paddocks so that we can remove a horse excluded if it's got an abscess or it needs special feed or we're introducing a new horse. 
um, we can separate them uh, and look after them. But we did go to the trouble of surfacing those yards, which is in a high rainfall in normal years um, property. Uh, we found that incredibly useful. And that's one of the raceways you can see the old fence line there. Important to fill in those holes. Um, Faz, who you saw earlier with the big bushy beard, made a point of telling me, make sure you fill in those holes. And that was, you know, good advice, of course. It, it makes sense, but I might not have thought of it initially. Um, so if you're pulling out old uh, or burnt fence posts, make sure those holes get filled in. Um, so that's, that's us getting busy with rebuilding. That's what it looks like today. Um, and uh, I, I'm planning to put a bit more shade around these particular yards, but it, it works quite well. This I'm going to talk about this little funny creation here in a moment. Um, and this is a few years ago. I think it was a year, this was a year out. So we'd got the most, I think it took us the best part of a year to get uh, new fences up and we just waited till we had the contractors that we wanted to work with. And uh, that was 12 months post fire. Uh, this is the boundary fence um, that into the forest and that's probably where we had the most maintenance. We had a stock fence there, um, uh, but no stock on the other side. So we thought about it and said, well, these permapine posts, which by the way, if you do take them, um, you if you have excess, uh, they just, they can't be burned or put into landfill or anything. So that's a consideration if you use the permapine, you'll have to store excess on your property, but we've made good use of them for our boundary fence and we just set three lines of what I call Baker, I think that's a brand name and that served us very well. The horses aren't interested in going over that fence line um, and it, it's got, it, we ha I don't think I've had to repair it once um, and the at native animals can go back and forth and I've let um, uh, all the native vegetation uh, grow up along that fence line and it forms its own boundary. Uh, this little area here if you're building raceways and you're riding horses along them um, and you've got a gate to open make sure you've got room to point your horse's head out um, if you just went straight up there it makes it very difficult so we've got a little um, pointy area that'll uh, to get to be able to open a gate from horseback um, this uh, the next challenge on our property um, and it, it applies to, to most and I'd read a very good little book by um, Peter Andrews called Back from the Brink um, before Samson Flat and I so I thought oh I've got an opportunity to do a few things with my water management. I was showing this photo um, this is the water course that when it rains at Kersbrook it really rains and we'd have um, a broad river running through this paddock um, when it's raining but this was the, a little dam that I chose to fill in, um, which really didn't serve any useful purpose and, uh, and uh, just dried out in the summer. So that was one thing I did when I was looking at rebuilding my property. Uh, I wanted to show you this one because uh, this is a little bit further north of that sort of the floodplain area and this hadn't been managed well when we bought the property and it was severely eroded uh, probably about two or three feet deep um, while I had the earth movers in I had some old fill around the place or I used what was coming out of here and there and we refilled in that we filled in that um, creek that eroded water course and fenced it off and this is how it looks today um, so we managed to repair that that was an opportunity to do that um, and and restore the water course to a better state and we've still got horses grazing there we haven't had to exclude them now that it's repaired these is these are uh, what I learned about they look a bit shabby at the moment but this is old straw or hay that I've put along here and I call these my water slowers another use for the permapine um, I've got some plantings there. Peter Andrews talks about leaky weirs. So the idea is that you said you send your water laterally um, and it saves that channeling and erosion. And these have worked really nicely just in two points um, on the on the valley um, that uh, give us that that the water charges down here, but when it hits here, it, it slows down and it goes to the side. So we haven't got the erosion that we used to have. Um, so that was something very useful and our natural resources management people helped us implement that. So it was something I learned post fire. 
This was an area of salinity um, that, uh, well, saline soil that I uh, have fenced off. It's in the corner of the paddock. Um, that was one of the recommendations from the Equicentral system is to try and remove corners where you can. Um, the other principles is that you keep horses in groups and uh, you have a central watering point. We did as much as we could in that way, but I wanted to show you this um, because this has been fenced off for a while and you can see that that's recovering quite nicely. This is where the water charges down and this is our second, this is the first water slower that it meets. Um, so in two points it's um, managed to allow, and this grass obviously slows down water once we start getting rain but of course there were still quite a few challenges in those first 12 months the first big rain event um, this is what we had up initially just straw bales with droppers um, they didn't really hold up to the water that charged down um, that water course and you can see this is the culvert at our front gate that's my little sign saying people you're welcome but please let us know um, and uh, you can see that that culvert that went under our drive clagged up with all the debris post fire. So yeah, another little challenge. And uh, in other rain events, we did lose that, uh, that driveway. So yet another thing to think about. And the trees that had had roots compromised around the dams uh, fell into the dam and caused us big, big holes in that first 12 uh, months after the fire. So lots of changes in your landscape and the trees, um, if you've got a tree property, um, are a bit of a challenge. But there were some opportunities and benefits to um, to the rethinking of our layout of the property. When we had larger paddocks um, and we could put horses in small herds, which is how we manage it today, uh, we've got less fencing and it's easier to maintain. We do the group housing. The horses are happier. Um, when we had single holding, I had a quite a noisy property and your horses would be calling out and they'd be tracking along fence lines or they'd be standing in corners looking for their mates or waiting for their feed. I now have a very quiet property with 12 horses kept on it and um, I believe that they're much happier. They can, they can groom each other, they can do their natural behaviours like sleeping which I think is really important that they tend not to do when they're housed on their own. Um, and the other benefit is that it's far less labour, far less input for us to be taking feeds to individual paddocks, to um, managing horses individually. It's uh, a lot less time I'm spent on that. What we might do differently, um, we would I would make wider gateways, maybe make them all a standard three metres for getting equipment and, and things through and vehicles. Um, I'd tweak a few little things on the installation, but not much um, as far as the layout goes. I'd make sure all my poly pipe was buried and I'd make sure we did a lot of it on our own, but maybe I could have um, worked in a little bit more with others as far as um, sourcing materials and talking about layout and so forth. So seeking some more advice possibly uh, before we went ahead and fenced. But Jason and I did all the fencing ourselves and we'd spend a lot of time just talking and visualising and laying out before we actually committed to where the fences went. Uh, that's and that's another look down the the dam down the race uh, down the raceway, and that's the front gate today. We did go with electric gates. We thought well, we'll have a bit of luxury after the fire, um, we so we don't have to get out and open and close gates. Um, that's something that we manage now, and it's important uh, for fire events. Uh, is that those gates, um, while they're operated by electricity, now we decommission those so they're open manually for fire events. Um, so that's 12 months post the fire. Five years later, which is more or less now, uh, many good things have happened. Uh, we've got closer friendships. Um, we've had the opportunity for self-reflection and we've improved our coping strategies. Uh, I've got I already loved nature, but I've got a greater appreciation of my native flora and fauna around the place. One of the beauties of eucalypts post fire is seeing that regeneration that comes out and the joys of riding through the forest nearby as it recovered was lovely to see the stages of regeneration. I've got an expanded knowledge of how to operate on my property and I've got, I think I've got improved property management. The hay feeders I'm going to show you a photo of that came out of um, the fire event. I've learned more about water management. I've got tons of firewood and I have an ever evolving fire plan. My pasture bounced back beautifully. Um, I think it benefited from a bit of um, 
carbon and so forth in it. And this is a paddock that we've cut hay off twice. I haven't reseeded. Uh, I, I only did one last season. I just let it rest and managed it as best I could and uh, did all my routine soil management that I was doing before. And thankfully it, it has bounced back really nicely. Um, these are the yards that I wanted to, that I put into the, all of them. And these is again, another labor saving device that we came up with after the fire, just an old pickle drum with a square cut in the bottom and you can put a bale of hay in there. Should you need to leave a horse in a yard, they've got, you don't have to cut hay to it. Um, uh, this is what I learned from a fellow who came across from Project Hope with a fodder donation, the Victorian operation, and he had these IBC crates and he had them filled with um, all the fodder, the bagged um, horse feed. And he said, oh, do you want me to leave these with you? And we went, mm, not really sure what we'd do with those, but thanks. And he said, no, you'll use them because I use them as hay feeders in my paddock. And you, this is one of the things that we did uh, that is now routine on the property and it fits in with the equicentral principles is that we have hay 24 seven for our horses. That's open at the top at the moment. But um, when I want to slow down consumption, this is a slow feeder hay net within it. We, the IBC crates, you just cut the top off, remove the tank, uh, and then we drop a slow feeder hay net in there. And then this takes about six bales of small squares and you close the top and the horses have ready access. It, it's helped my pasture regenerate because they, they often choose the hay over, it depends on how sweet it is, um, but they will choose the hay over the pasture. So it took the pressure um, off the, off, off the um, pasture as it recovered and that's something just we have routinely now in all the paddocks. Easy to move around on a pallet fork or um, on your tractor or we did until I had a tractor, we moved them with a trailer behind a quad. Uh, this is the paddock I reseeded uh, most recently. It was our weakest paddock and it's come up really nicely with fairly minimal input. I wanted to, we're almost at the end of what's happened five years. By the way, in uh, as the fire happened and we were looking around and somebody I recall very strongly saying, this is going to take people five years at least to rebuild from. And I, sort of internally scoffed at that and thought, nah, I'm going to be done in 12 months. Well, five years was absolutely right. We've still got a little bit of work to do. Um, you'll all be tweaking and revising your fire plans, I'm sure. Um, but this is just ours that helps us manage um, it when we get a fire threat in the property and, uh, and prepare on the night before. We manage all our horses on property because there's not enough um, there's too many and they're not experienced travellers and we haven't got enough floats or trucks or anything for people to move horses if it should a fire be threatened and my experience with Samson Flat is that caused more harm than good is trying to evacuate horses in a hurry or as a fire threatens. Um, so I'm happy with leaving our horses on the property um, but our registers do have the option the night before when the ratings are, are, are put out of taking their individual horses to their safe havens. Um, but the property is closed and uh, we manage uh, the, the the property without um, other people coming and going. It's, it's just too stressful to have people coming and going when you're when you're in that event. Um, you just need to manage it yourself. Is our is our experience. But if you've got good capable friends who can, who maybe don't live on rural properties and you want the help, then your fire plan is entirely yours. It, it's what works for you. Um, so uh, that's our fire plan. One of the hidden cost benefits that I mentioned to people um, when we had our talk recently is uh, managing trees post fire. A lot of our um, more mature gums obviously look like they survived the fire, but their roots were compromised. So it's been a busy and expensive process to remove those trees that might be a risk to horses or fences or humans. Uh, and aesthetically, you don't want to be looking for the rest of your life at dead trees. So that is, um, a cost that will be ongoing that I'd encourage you to have a little think about. Um, but it's also a benefit. A good, a good part of that uh, is uh, usable firewood. Uh, that's, we've got piles of it still to split and get into the fridge. So the end, uh, get into the fridge, <laughs> get into the fire storage. Uh, the end is in sight five years later. It's been a process. It's been a good process. I 
do believe in post-traumatic growth. I think um, uh, if we can if we can get to that point, then that's a good thing. But we've got one little job to do, and this is the remainder of the permapine posts. Uh, that this this is a, a, a dress was a dressage arena, uh, and the, all the fencing burnt, and it just got put down our priority list because we have the luxury of two other work areas. So this is our last job to do post Samson flat that will put things more or less back the way they were, um, but different and better. Um, so that's the end of my talk. I want to thank you all for listening or taking the time to have a look at this webinar. And I do hope that it helps you in your process of recovery and helps you build some resilience post fire events.